Okay, um, so let's start with um, methodological limitations. Um, as Claire mentioned, um, we've defined this as the extent to which there are problems in the design or conduct of the primary studies that support an individual review finding. And we express, we might be less confident that the finding reflects the phenomenon of interest, the focus of the review, when the primary studies underlying a review finding have problems in the way they were designed or conducted. Now, um, that would be assessed using a critical appraisal tool for qualitative studies. Um, and typically these tools make appraisals of how participants and settings were selected, how data was collected and analyzed, researcher reflexivity, and so on. Um, we don't, within Grade Circle, recommend the use of a specific tool at present for assessing methodological limitations um, because there's no widespread agreement within the community about what the best tool is. But we do have a research agenda in place that's trying to look at the core items that, that should be assessed. And that's, um, in the meantime, we recommend that people use a critical appraisal tool that they're comfortable with. Um, that might be CASP, it might be one of the other many tools that have been developed. The second component, component is relevance, and we've defined this as the extent to which the body of evidence from the primary study supporting a review finding is applicable to the context specified in the review question. So in any review question, um, there'll be a context specified in terms of the, the population, the health issue, perhaps an intervention, and um, there may be specific settings specified as well, primary care or communities and so on. So we're less confident that a finding reflects the phenomenon of interest when the context of the primary studies underlying that finding are substantively different from the context of the review question. Now you can imagine um, there's a lot of different possible variations here, and I'll just run through some of those briefly. Um, one might be in direct relevance. So this would be a situation where, for example, you have a synthesis um, focusing on children aged 10 to 18 years, but you, you, have, you can't find studies from children that age, or you have some studies that are from children in a different age group. So then we would have this issue of indirect relevance, and you'd have to judge how important that indirectness is. Um, partial relevance may also arise. So for example, when you're looking at that same synthesis on, on children and you only have studies that look on girls, look at girls rather than um, both girls and boys. Um, so what you'd have there is partial relevance. It's difficult to judge um, the relevance of the data from girls only to the, the population that you've specified in the review question. In some instances, the relevance may be uncertain. For example, if the ages of the children in some of the studies are un is unclear, or um, if the settings are unclear, and so on. So moving on to the third component, which is coherence. This is an assessment of how clear and cogent the fit is between the data from the primary studies and the review finding. I just want to point out for those of you who um, uh, looked at the PLOS paper that we published on Circle that this definition has um, changed a bit since then. So in relation to cons coherence, we're less confident that a finding reflects the phenomenon of interest when some of the data contradict the finding or some of the data are ambiguous. Um, this is a, a sort of visual representation of what may happen to data in a qualitative synthesis. So if you, on your left-hand side of the slide are a lot of sort of pinky red dots, and you can imagine those to be data from individual studies. And in the process of creating a review finding based on those data, there'll be some degree of transformation of the material um, to reach that finding. So in some instances, that transformation may just be creating a summary of that data. Um, that would be what we would call a sort of descriptive finding. But in some instances, it may be taken further. That data may be used to develop um, an element of a theory or a new hypothesis. Um, and that would be a more transformed or interpretive um, finding. Um, now, um, 
you can imagine that in the process of creating um, a more interpretive finding, you, it may um, be the case that some of the detail, the underlying detail from the primary studies um, is not retained. Um, in, in that case, um, issues around coherence may arise and it would be a trade-off between on the one hand having a finding which um, allows you to develop a hypothesis or theory and on the other hand um, including all the the, de the sort of detailed descriptive information that underlies or is part of the underlying data. Um, and we can say a little bit more about that perhaps when we get to the question time. The final component is adequacy of data, which, as Claire mentioned, focuses on the degree of richness and quantity of data supporting a review finding. And we're less confident that a finding reflects the phenomenon of interest when the data underlying the finding are not sufficiently rich or come from only a small number of studies or participants. Review authors need to make a judgment in the context of the specific review finding on what constitutes data that are not sufficiently rich or are drawn from too small a number of studies. For example, um, if you have a finding that's more interpretive in nature, that's in other words um, uh, making a hypothesis about how something works or how people feel in a broad, about an issue in a broader sense, you may um, require richer data or data from a larger number of studies to feel confident in that finding. Um, on the other hand, if you have a simple descriptive finding, um, you may have a lower threshold in terms of what's adequate um, uh, with regard to the number of studies and the richness of the data. So once we've done um, an assessment of each of the four circle components, um, we need to make an overall assessment by drawing together um, these different um, assessments for each component. And um, this overall assessment can be, as Claire mentioned, um, high, moderate, low, or very low. Just to say a bit more about what we mean by that, if we say we have high confidence in a finding, we're saying it's highly likely that the finding is a reasonable representation of the phenomenon of interest. Um, on the other hand, a very low confidence finding suggests that it's not clear whether the review finding is a reasonable representation of the phenomenon of interest, and the other two fall in between. Um, we've developed um, a qualitative evidence profile for CERQUAL. Um, those of you familiar with grade for effectiveness will recognize this. This is a, a simple um, table that allows uh, review authors to present each review finding and each of the assessments for um, the four components, their overall assessment and an explanation of that assessment or judgment. Um, it's important because it enhances the transparency of the assessment process um, and can be included as an appendix to a qualitative evidence synthesis. For users, we also have the summary of qualitative findings table. This is a simplified version that firstly presents the review finding, secondly the overall assessment of confidence, third the underlying explanation of that assessment and finally a list of the studies that contribute. And again, this is a way of making these assessments transparent and usable uh, for those who might be reading the review. 